exhibition. My name is John Stenhouse. I'm the business support manager for the University of Essex. And I'm here today to introduce our masterclass on investment readiness. Now, this masterclass is being presented on behalf of the university by William Miller and Nitin Patel and ably assisted by Josh Clark. And this investment readiness session is part of a series of our space to grow webinars, which we operate throughout the year. And you're more than welcome to attend these because they are all free to join. And the outcomes of all of this is the fact that those successful businesses who learn how to become investment ready can join us on our Angels at Essex equity investment platform and raise funding. We've raised over five million so far this year for innovative, high growth entrepreneurs looking to uh, change the way we do things. So I would now like to hand over to my team to uh, run this masterclass and enjoy everybody. I know I do. OK, good. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see the um, screen and um, welcome and thank you for taking time out to attend the masterclass this afternoon. What uh, Nitin and I are going to do throughout the next hour or thereabouts is uh, introduce you to the contents of an investment pitch deck. The pitch deck itself is the mechanism that you would use to engage with an investor and by using that as the framework for the contents of your presentation we can provide you with the information that you will need in order to uh, engage with the investor themselves and seek equity investment. So our agenda this afternoon is before we delve into um, the, the ins and outs and the detail of seeking that equity investment, we just want to ask the first question, is equity investment right for you? It may not necessarily be the thing that you uh, want to have. It may be something you're thinking about and the, there are other options. And then when we go through that, we'll go into the contents of the deck itself and we'll summarise at the end. As we go through, we'll pose a number of questions just to give you a chance to think and uh, think about the answers themselves. So moving on, first question to ask is, is equity investment right for you? Remember that um, when you uh, seek equity investment, that means that you're selling part of your business in the form of shares to another person. So there's a few things spring out of that immediately. The first thing is that you must have shares to sell. Uh, so that means your company structure must be right. Not all company structures have got shares that can be sold. Uh, other people in the business must also be willing to uh, understand the implications of share selling those shares. It then brings other people into the company. Um, so you may now bring outside people with uh, different interests into that business. So it's no longer uh, your business to control. They will be involved in some of the decision making as well and they may want to be very active investors and help you as you grow and build the business. So that means you need to be prepared to listen to them and take their advice on board, um, deal with it as you wish, but it's no longer about you, yourself running that business. And what their agenda is that they're looking for um, a return on the money that they've invested. Instead of putting it in the bank or putting it into shares in another company, they've come to you and they're looking for something, could be a 10 times return in five to seven years or less, something like that. Those figures, you need to think about that and think about can your business support the investment returns that the investor wants to make. So if you think about all of that and uh, maybe decide that equity investment's not right, then what else is there? Well, there are, are other forms of investment available. There are uh, debt in the form of bank loans or director's loans. There may be grants available to you and there may be other forms of um, ways of getting money into the business based on future sales or something like that. Overall, the thing to say, it's a journey. Uh, it's, it's not just a start and a finish, it's a journey. So be prepared for that journey. Be prepared for uh, high points and low points along the way. So just to make you think a little bit, um, as well as equity investment, have you invested other forms of funding for your business? 
So yeah, I mean, there's a number of ways of funding your business at the early stage. I know most people want to look at equity investment uh, as a way forward, but sometimes that's difficult. So you do have to look at a number of ways. Uh, and one of the reasons for this question is really to sort of ponder the different ways of things that allow you to start a business like grants, like small loans, or even getting into partnerships with some bigger businesses. So think about that. And that's what uh, investment is about, to be flexible in the form that you see how you can start your business up. Thanks, Bill. OK, so if we get into preparing yourself for an investment, now this is this is about investment in any form, uh, but primary at that stage, it is about someone else buying into your company. So what we need for that is what we've called a pitch deck, and this is your investment pitch deck. Now, there's a number of pitch decks that vary in form, depending on who your audience is. But this is the key one to put in front of people who are going to invest money in you. Uh, and as a result of this particular set of documents that tell your story about how you came about the problem, why you think it's a problem that needs a solution. Uh, and really, if you look at the slide itself, there's about 11 sections within it, which take the investor from where the problem started to how you are going to resolve that, create a business model, and also at the end of it, tell him exactly where you are so he can then make his decision about whether he wants to invest or not. Uh, we will go through all of these in a bit more detail as we progress through this presentation. Thanks, Bill. Okay. okay, as we said, the first key thing to get across to any investor is the problem statement. And what we mean by this is about getting him to understand the idea you've got and why this is a solution to a problem that you know needs a solution which someone will pay for so you can create value. So the statement really needs to get across that it's a real problem. It needs to make sure it's understandable by someone who's not necessarily from that industry because most investors will not always be from the industry you may be working in. You've got to know a little bit about the problem. It always helps. It's if it's down to something that you've experienced uh, because you know then the insides and outsides of all the things that are sent around this particular problem and really understand where the problem sits. Is it in an in industry uh, section or is it someone who needs the solution on an individual basis? Bill, do you want to add to that? Uh, just just a comment. Um, this is something you've said, but to pick up on it too, um, make sure that the problem is understood by the investor because as Nitin says, they may not uh, know about an industry specifically, but if they can understand it from the end user's perspective and understand the benefits that any solution to that problem will provide, then that gives them a good grounding in what the problem is and where it applies. And it will also start to make them think about the size of the opportunity, the market size in the future. Okay. So the solution statement, this is your understanding of how you are going to solve the problem you've identified. Uh, and this again is the other side of the problem solution where you clearly define how you are going to go about solving that problem you've identified. It again needs to be clearly expressed. It needs to be reasonably well defined in terms of whether it's a product that's going to solve the problem, whether it's a, a piece of software or a combination. It's at this stage you've got to be able to identify a rough construction of how the solution will suit the problem you've identified. Uh, and again, this is a field where it is very important that you give a clear understanding that the solution you're proposing will fit the definition of the problem uh, because at this stage you've got to have been reasonably confident of 
the problem you're solving and be able to express how you plan to solve it. Bo? Yeah, it's, it's important that the solution does fit the problem. Make sure that you're not creating a solution and then looking for a problem that, that applies to, but make sure you've identified the problem and you've now got a solution to it and, and the two link together. And those two statements are the framework on which everything else is built. Because um, when you state the problem and state the solution, you're then opening the door to a lot of why questions that the investor will want to ask. So they want to know, well, why is your solution the best? How does it compare to other competitors? Why are you best placed to deliver it? What have you done so far? Why is now a good time to put this solution into the marketplace? And why will people buy from you? So make sure the two things are linked and then be you're now setting up the investor to ask a lot of questions which you're going to answer in the next slide. OK, so now you've defined the problem, you've identified a solution and you're going to go and investigate on how you get how much investment you need from either an individual or an organization. And the key here is to really understand what investment you want, how much you are prepared to value your business set. So when they do invest, the percentage that they own is clear to them and to yourselves. Now this raises an area which can be quite controversial in, in terms of the early discussions with an investor because his investment will be worth something as a percentage based on how you go about valuing the worth of your business at the stage you're willing to ask him to invest in. Uh, and this can be done by a number of ways. And you know, you compare yourselves to a, an industry where you are actually being working into and see how those companies are valued. You've got a solution that you know people are looking to buy because you've had that early contact uh, and it gives you a feel that you know you're worth quite a lot but be prepared to negotiate because unless there's a very clear defined value that you can really sit there and justify then the uh, the investment and the value of the investment that the investor is willing to make will always be a negotiation but be prepared as we said with the best value and the best information you have bill yeah, just a, a couple of additional points. Um, think about what your fundraising journey is going to be like. You know, are you now looking for a single round of funding and is that going to take you through to um, the point where you become um, revenue generating and health uh, more likely to be able to fund yourself? Or are you going to do uh, several rounds of fundraising? Um, each one of those has got advantages and disadvantages. If you spend a lot of time fundraising, you're not going to spend the time running the business, but asking for a lot of money up front early might be difficult to get an investor to commit to all of that. And then the other thing to think about, uh, we talk about the investment in terms of the financial income that it brings to the business, but think too that that investor may bring something else along with them. So think about what else you might ask him or her to bring to bring to the business? You know, are you looking for their expertise in a particular area? Are you looking for them to open doors for you to generate sales leads? Are you looking for their network and so on? So just think about the, uh, the advantages beyond uh, finance coming into the business. Okay, uh, and then the, obviously the next stage that the investor will want to know is what is the money going to use for? Uh, and generally, they would not necessarily want to see the money being used as salaries or cars, as we say, which is some of the areas that potentially people would imagine that you could use investment for. Now, for a reasonably well-developed business at a later round, that's always acceptable. For an early stage business trying to get its first investment, it's always very tough to t ask an investor and say, give me some money to invest into my business and 50 percent of that is going to be on salaried for four of the guys who've been founding now this isn't always the wrong approach if the guys who've 
part of that startup have a lot of hands-on skills and have developed the solution to the problem a long way down the path because this is what starts valuing your business uh, and there's obviously a, a sort of expectation from investors as to the amount of effort that you have put into building this business to the stage where you are ready for investment. So it's very important that you clearly understand that what you've put in as a value, uh, that value is got to be measured against the market and the solution you provided to the market in terms of its uh, innovation and its acceptability to the customers. Going forward from there, you've got to clearly be able to define every stage where the investor's money is going to be and how that's going to benefit the growth of that business, be it completing a system, uh, using it for marketing, moving into new businesses. But it's clearly an expectation that you would have a reasonably detailed understanding of spending that investment to grow the business. Bill? Yeah, it's, it's important that um, you present it in the form of outcomes uh, from the investment, uh, because when you put in, when you show what's going into the business in terms of salaries or capital spend or buying equipment or whatever, that shows me what's going in, but it doesn't show me what's coming out as a result of doing that. And if you show how the, the money going in generates a positive outcome for the business, shows growth, then it's much easier to justify what the funding is needed for. If you simply pitch it in terms of we need to buy X, Y and Z without telling what that will do for the business, then it becomes a question of do you really need that or can you get away with a cheaper one or something like that? So the investors will drill into um, each item that you're going to spend money on and you need to be able to justify it. And the other sort of a side comment here, but be wary if you're spending money on developing software because if you know if you can't do it yourself or if you haven't got a good control over doing it yourself, um, investors always look on the development of software as being a risk to the business because with apologies to any software engineers, we all know that software costs more to develop and takes longer than what's originally predicted. So they always see that as risky. So make sure that you've, if you're developing software, you've got a good story around it. So moving on, just to reinforce that and give you a chance to think, what is the most convincing statement for an investor? Statement A says, we would like £150,000 to pay my co-founder and my salary as well as the rent on our new office. Or statement B, we would like £150,000 to develop a new release of our app based on feedback from our existing users and close 50 sales for £75,000 revenue in the next nine months. Okay, uh, I mean, those statements are pretty sort of opposite each other and most people will guess B is the more acceptable statement to make to an investor. But I suppose the reason for putting this into the discussion and identifying very clearly what can be acceptable and what can't at the earlier stage is because occasionally I think people do get confused as to what they can use investments for. Sometimes it's more the fact that you're looking at your business from a different stage as to where an investment may look for, because if you've progressed the business to a, a level where you may be getting some revenues, uh, but all those revenues are still being eaten up into the business, uh, but the business is growing, then there may be an opportunity that investor may finance some elements of a living salary if you are struggling to maintain a level uh, from the business or have run out of the support you may already have. So it's that point to be sensible around this question uh, and seriously looking at most of the investment being ploughed into the business to make it grow, be it even if it's a revenue spend or marketing. Okay, thanks Nathan. Okay. Okay, the stage we're now getting to is building up the platform for your business. So here we've got to really understand the market opportunities, how we define the market, breaking down the market into sort of segments that you can really operate within uh, and 
the realistic achievement that you will gain over a period uh, in that market. One of the things that investors really struggle with uh, in terms of some of the presentations we see is when they have a big global market and people say, well, we're going to get half a percent of it uh, within a year. And it sort of defeats the sort of object on what this opportunity and explanation allows you to do, because this is your chance to show the investor your knowledge about the market. So you really need to drill into it and understand where your solution will provide the customer the key and as to why he will then pay you to provide that solution. So it's an opportunity where one, you need to understand this, otherwise you won't be looked at in a very serious context from an investor point of view. But two, this is an ability for you to really get all your knowledge about this particular market because, you know, as we said very early, that you would be knowledgeable about the problem because either it affected you personally or it's a solution that you require as part of your work. So you know it quite well uh, and you know why there is a demand for that. Boom? Yeah, from, from my perspective, I've perspective I come from an engineering background so I like to know how things work so if you tell me that you're going to get one percent of one percent or one percent of a market um, I that doesn't mean much to me but if you tell me that you're going to sell um, so many of um, units of your product or service to 150 businesses in the next 24 months that has a bit more meaning so we kind of need to look at what who's your ideal customer is. Remember in your problem and solution statement, you will have been thinking about who the customers are for your, your offering. So if you can identify your ideal customer, then you can figure out, well, how many of those are there when, when you're doing your market research and how many are similar to those that might be able to take your offering. And from that, you can build up a picture from the bottom up, which is much more realistic. And that will then turn and turn guide your sales effort. But then also don't forget that uh, this market may exist now, but how, how long will it last? How long will you, you have the opportunity to participate in it? What will come in from outside that will disrupt it? You know, will there be new entrants coming in? There will there be new technologies or new legislation that will change that marketplace? So while you can think of maybe over a period of five or six or seven years, you will generate uh, this amount of revenue. Will it last for that amount of time? So those are things you need to take into consideration as well. OK, so the next part of this process is then to create your revenue projections. Now, it sounds simple, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done behind the scenes to actually make this a realistic proposition from a revenue projection point of view. You, know, you need to know your costs. You need to know what the market would stand for your service. You need to have a good understanding of the sort of market penetration you will make over a period uh, and be very specific in your sort of definition of how this is constructed because there will always be a question because it's a forecast uh, and the opportunity to explain why at certain stages you can see different amounts of growth which again is a good plan if you can actually understand and give that understanding to the investor in a concise way as to why that is the realistic approach. Sometimes there's a big cycle before someone will pay you money on projects uh, and so you could be engaged for a long time before the revenues start coming in and then they start coming in in a higher number. But if that's the sort of project then explain as to why the curve when you have put it together looks like that. So it, it's important on the one sense that you build a meaningful way of generating this revenue projection, but don't get too carried away into the very finite detail. It's more about clearly being able to define the realistic reasons as to why your thinking and your approach in creating this revenue is of that type. Because at this stage, if you have no revenue, then the investor is buying into your knowledge, your understanding of your problem 
and your solution that you're providing. So it's very important that you keep him on side with a logical approach to the whole thing. Uh, and this is one of the tools that you can show that you understand the picture from the outside in, in terms of your business. Will? Yeah, one, one of the things you can do is just do a, a bag of the envelope calculation to make sure that you, the projections that you've got are achievable. So for, for example, say that you're going to project £300,000 worth of revenue in year one, and each customer spends on average £1,000. Well, that means you need to have 300 sales in year one, or that's about six per week, or on average one per day. And so the question is, is that achievable? You know, one per day may be easily achievable, two per day may be possible, so your projection is low, or one per day may be too, too much and your projection is too high, but you can do sort of simple back of the envelope calculations just to check on that. And also, you know, don't forget about what we said earlier, don't forget about new entrants coming into the marketplace, don't forget about competition, don't forget about churn, uh, from losing some of your customers as time goes on. So if you can build all of that into a model, and particularly if you can make it parameterized such that you can ask what if questions, you know, what if my sales double, what if I, my churn goes from 10% to 20%, then that's a good uh, thing to have for a discussion with an investor. And now um, we're going to ask the question, which is the more convincing market research? So. Uh, answer A, I asked four friends and my mum and dad and they all said it was a good idea. Or answer B, I surveyed 100 potential customers. 73 said they would buy my product when it was launched, it was something they needed. Eight more said they would buy it with some modifications which they suggested. Okay, this is an interesting uh, piece of uh, a question. Uh, I mean, in my past, when I did get involved with designing, I used to ask my friends and my mum uh, and whether she liked the, the new knob we're going to put on the cooker or not. Uh, and it depends on really where your market is. But realistically, obviously, you need a wide variety of uh, customer bases to actually give you what they think. And it's still very important that you keep in mind where you started to come from in providing solution. So it's not always something that you will get an answer to that will solve all your questions, but it will give you an indication on things that you're doing right, areas that you're considering fit the need and things that you might have missed. So I, I'm a firm believer that the mix of your own knowledge, getting some information from the outside to mix with where your thoughts are in that early development stage is a key because your solution if it isn't unique then it's going to stand a little chance of succeeding in a market that may already have the solution so because it's unique you might not always get the sort of answers you need from customers and that's why innovation and invention is important that you can provide something that people not necessarily have thought of as a way of doing things. OK, okay. just I think it's important to also add that your market research, you don't do that once and it's finished. You've got to keep doing that as you go along. Uh, listen to your customers, hear what they're telling you and adapt and adjust uh, accordingly. OK, so now we're getting into the real hard part of any early stage business because now you've got to get to talk with people who don't always want uh, to sort of understand how much it's costing you to make something, how much time you spent. They're interested really in whether it will fit their needs, whether what they're getting and what they may have to pay is going to be value adding to whatever they want to use it for. So sales and marketing is a function that needs to be thought of in a fairly early stage of a business because how you market the product depends on the product, your audience, uh, the sort of industry you're in, what the industry uh, listens to. You know, it may be something that works around legislation. So they, you know, things you have to get ready for a marketing event, maybe getting some 
regulations approved through government agencies, so it enhances your ability to sell that going forward. So marketing and how you market and what you develop as tools for your marketing are very much part of the process. And also it's a cost that you incur as you get older in your business life where you go into the market and you want as many people to know about your existence, your product, your performance and your cost. So it's an element that sometimes doesn't come into uh, people's thoughts uh, till later on, but it's an element that people do have to keep in mind that at some point you would have to look at these two functions in a much more deeper sense than just looking at the idea, how you get the idea up and running technically. Now, we tend to talk about sales and marketing here as a combined because in an early stage business, it normally tends to be one person or a person with various responsibilities looking at it. But there are obviously two different functions when you go out to the real world. As we say, one's marketing, which actually costs you money. The second is sales, which is there to bring you money. Uh, and that's a different approach to how you talk to the customers, how you link with them, the sort of models you use to actually create value for them and also revenue for yourselves. So it's very important that you understand what the market you're aiming your business into will stand. One, as a way of them doing business with you and two, what is acceptable. Now you can go to the extreme and also break that model provided you've got some, some something very, very unique and serious that they're all willing to do something different than they're what, what they're normally used to. So it's, a, it's important that you sort of look at the two aspects in a slightly different manner within the business. Bill? I think, I think it helps too to understand who your ideal customer is and what they're looking for and what their values are and how, what triggers them to make a purchase and when they make the, that purchase so that you can tailor your marketing towards them. And then when it comes to sales, you know, think about the um, market segments that you're selling into. So if you're, for example, got a software as a service a solution, which is going to be sold to a large enterprise, you can identify the benefits that it will provide to that enterprise, but that might be a benefit attached to a user. The user may not hold the budget to buy uh, the software as a service solution, and neither of those two may be the decision maker as to whether to buy it or not. So you'll find out that selling into a large enterprise means a long sales cycle, can take uh, months, it can take years. So be wary when you're thinking about how your revenue is coming in. Um, be wary that some of that can be delayed and it can take a while to, to generate that first sale and then the second sale and afterwards. Uh, if you're selling to small companies, then that means smaller sales values different approach to selling. Maybe you're selling a dr directly to the CEO rather than to a purchasing department. And then if you're in the retail, that's usually volume sales, um, which means uh, low margins. Hence, you need to have low overheads in your sales activity. So depending on who your customers are, uh, what sectors you're operating in, you'll have different strategies that you need to work out and, and develop as you go along. OK, uh, as we said, one of one of the areas that you really need to be very familiar with is the competition. So all these subjects we are talking about at the moment are all about you knowing your customers, knowing your market, knowing who is going to actually sign the check for your product. And this element, the competition is about knowing the sort of products that will compete with you for the same customers that you are going to target your product as. Uh, and it's about understanding how they do business, how their solution provides the buyer an opportunity to sort of do what he wants with it. So when you approach them to actually say, well, this is something better, then you can politely but well understanding the, their product, tell him why yours is better and where yours performance if it's 
if this is the case or a lower cost as to why you are able to do those things. So it's not a case of, well, it's better because I say so or it's new or, you know, it's got four rockets uh, around the uh, periphery to make it faster. It's really clearly understanding the business reasons why someone will buy you over a competitor's product. And it's also about understanding the uniqueness that you provide because that's what will entice someone to buy something, particularly if it's an existing market that you are going into and improving the performance or an efficiency of doing the business currently existing. And the bottom line there about IP is one of the key areas that if you can get an IP for your product, then do so. And if you can't, always check that you're not going to be breaking someone else's IP uh, in, in terms of delivering your idea to market. Bill? Yeah, just on that last point, um, you may be doing something for which you can't get a patent or you may not be infringing it, but you more than likely will have something that you can trademark and be very careful that you're not accidentally infringing somebody else's trademark. I've known of a business, a local business who accidentally infringed a trademark. Well, as a result of that, they had to close the business for a couple of days while they rebranded everything and got it back uh, with a brand new uh, branding associated with it. And it was all purely accidental. So you can search for patents on the databases, you can search for trademarks, and you can search for other things like registered designs as well to make sure that you're not infringing on somebody else's work by accident. Okay. <clears throat> so just to reinforce that, here's a couple of a couple of statements on IP. First one says we have UK and EU patents in place for our product. Uh, second statement, we have thought carefully about our IP strategy and decided not to patent anything as that will publish what we do. So um, which of those is the better statement or it could it be either depending on the company strategy? OK, so IP is always something that if you've got it and have the ability to file it, then do it. I know it costs money and it can take time, but it always makes your investor much more comfortable that what he's investing in is one, it's got some uniqueness because someone's done the study and the analysis for him to say there is something different about this and in the market they're pursuing it's quite unique. Uh, and secondly, it stops competitors copying quickly. It doesn't necessarily avoid them copying or changing some things to get into it. Uh, if you don't have the ability for to get an IP and you find that you can't get IP very early, then don't spend too much money and effort trying to fight it. Just get on with it and get the product running uh, and be first to market. But it's a good way of understanding where you stand in the market with uniqueness. And, and there are a few companies who take the conscious decision that they're not going to uh, patent anything because when you patent something, it puts it into the public domain and they may not want to do that for particular reasons. But that's a, a very conscious decision that a business has to take. OK, so we're now getting much further up the scale in getting this business up and organised to be ready for one, operating, and two, for the investor to really understand the amount of work you've done. Now, these elements here we talk about are all things that you need to know to create some aspects of this investor deck. But one of the key areas, particularly where you're talking about producing ideas and products that would improve efficiency for the customer, you have to understand the costs that you're incurring and the value of that cost that you can get back. Unless it's something really, really different and something never available, it breaks an idea uh, problem down or solves that has always been very hard to do, then the cost plus model would not necessarily work. It needs to be cost plus value. Uh, and what I mean by value is making sure that everything you are uh, 
trying to charge higher than the cost or in comparison to a com competitor, it's easily understood as to why someone buying that will want to pay that. And sometimes it's as simple as looks. Other times it's more difficult, but it is important that you weigh up what you are putting into the market in comparison to what is always there and the cost you want someone to pay as to why there is a real value they will create from paying that cost. Bill? Yeah, I mean, the business model is really the answer to the question, how do you plan to make money, which is something the investors will ask. So you need to make sure that you clearly understand your business model because investors will drill into it. They're more than likely to have more experience of you on different business models. So they will ask you questions about why are you doing it this way? Uh, what's the reason for that? So be prepared to um, explain what you're doing, discuss it, and to take advice if they think there's a better way of doing it. Okay, so we're now getting towards the end of the deck in its sort of construction, but the, the, the actual content of the team are the key that have started the business. So this is really, a, as I said, at the start of the process, that at the stage where you're an early stage investment opportunity, people are really looking at the ability of the team, not only the idea. Uh, and so it's good to have a, a well sort of organized team that can work within itself. It complements each other, but that's not always the case. Uh, so you have to build that as you go further down. Sometimes it's by learning relevant skills. It's other, other times it's by acquiring people with that knowledge onto the board or advisors to help you move through specific areas of developing this business, which you don't have experience or knowledge about. But overall, the key team, which are going to be around for a period uh, till this business is up and running, are the guys that you really need to get across to the investors and their abilities uh, and their understanding that this team has got the capabilities to take the money from them invested in the right manner as you've described up to that point and also deliver the sort of objective you set yourself and targets that you need to achieve for the sort of investments. Bill? Yeah, I think, um, all, all of the while we tend to focus on, on the business and the market opportunity and the business opportunity, but remember that business is made up of people. Um, so it's important that an investor understands that there is a a team of people in there or the ability to build a team uh, if the founder is on his own or there's a couple of founders they've got the ability to build that team and take the business forward with it so while there's only one slide uh, in the deck uh, describing the team nevertheless it is a very important factor of the whole business itself um, and if you have gaps then that will help guide you to where maybe an advisor an investor can help providing that uh, advice to you. So just moving on and to reinforce the point about um, dealing with competitors, which is the better statement on competitors? Answer A, all of our competitors are rubbish at what they do and we intend to be better. Or answer B, we've identified four direct competitors, but, our, but the unique value add for our product is that users can deploy our system without any additional integration. Okay, well, A is obviously the sort of thought you would incur to be positive in your mind, but B is how you sell it. You really got to get across the fact that not they're rubbish, you are better in lots of places than the competitors. Uh, and really that's about adding the value that you add to that opportunity through the uniqueness and deploying systems that have lots of things that are going to make life easier for the customer. Okay, Bill. I think, I think just to reinforce the answer A, um, by saying that you are better, you're also saying that other people are not so good. So be prepared uh, for them to challenge you, uh, make because they may find that you, they may come to you and say, well, you're making statements that we're not as good as you, but we feel we are. 
And so you have to be able to justify any statement that you make about the competition. So just be, be wary of that cropping up. It may come up if you attend a trade show or something like that there where you're on a stand and your competitors on a stand, so they may come and challenge you. Okay, now th this is an important slide that people sort of forget in our experience of looking at lots of decks because what you forget because you're totally involved in the business and you're focused on investment is what you may have already achieved. So looking at the current status is about highlighting the key things you as a team, the business that's developed uh, and been going for a while before you've decided you need investment has achieved. So it's ensuring that everything that would add to the understanding of the investors to why this business, this product is going to get customers, you need to be able to tell people. Now, we sometimes say, depending on how the business has been developing and how long it's around, that you put a status uh, slide in or you make sure the elements on this slide are in context in the right places throughout the presentation. So if you're talking about sales, you can highlight that we've actually already got some customer ed engagement with a couple of guys who've started to on our product or done some trials. So, uh, and it's an area people forget because as I said, sometimes from thinking an idea to looking for investment, you might have already been around 12, 18 months, but you might have done a lot of these things. So it's always relevant to make sure that you identify the things that are positive in your development. Bill? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a key point because people are so in, involved in the business and have achieved certain things, they tend, they tend to forget it because they're looking forward about all the other things they've got to do. So it's important to present that, write it down in a format that the investor can see you've already done this, we've invested this amount of money to take us to this point, which has got us this number of sales or this engagement with customers, or we're already talking to somebody about a large contract or we won a grant, because all of those things that go around the business validate what is going on. So if you've got customers, that validates what's going on. If you've got a grant, that validates what's going on. If you've got investment from other parties, that's validating everything that you're doing. So it means that the investor can look at it and say, well, there are other people who say this is a good idea. It's not just the entrepreneur who's saying it's a good idea. I can see that other people have said it's a good idea for whatever reason. So it's important to put that information in and make people understand um, where, you, where you are now, where you've come from and where you think you're going to. OK, so we're now at the end of our sort of development of the investment pitch deck. Uh, and as it says here, the deck is there to tell a story. It's to tell the story in a way that the investor will be interested to discuss with you in detail as to what you are planning to do with the investment should he make it. It's your chance to impress and ex impress him in terms of where you as a team have been able to take the business from the idea stage to a current status where you are happy that you can ask someone to invest in, feel comfortable that you will make a return for them. The story needs to be consistent. That's why we talk about it as a story. It needs to follow from start to finish a linked up process that gives by the end of the 18 pages, 16 pages that you may put together, a reason why I want to invest in this. And obviously the start of it is the core idea, but along that process of developing the end result of how much you need the investor to invest, you have to take care of all those other things that we've said, because that's what will make the confidence. Now, the challenge you also have in different stages that you may pitch in is the amount of time you have to get this across. So preparing and understanding all those things are very important. So when you do get these different elements of time and stages that you know exactly what will make the right impression for the investors to actually talk to you. Always do your research, understand 
the people in the room, the sort of backgrounds they're going to come from, uh, because investing now isn't as sort of straightforward as it was in the early stages of startups, where you had a, a lot of angel investors looking for opportunities uh, to just find businesses they were interested in, they could support. Uh, now you've got people who do that even with institutional money, but then they want to know a lot more than the angel investor may. So there's also a, an opportunity where you may actually say, well, do I really want to do this? Uh, because you don't have to sell to anyone, as the last line says. So make sure you're prepared for all outcomes. Bill? Yeah, I think the, the key thing is that the story follows a logical progression and you want to present it in such a way that the only one thing the investor's thinking about is, you know, how much money do they want and can that should, you know, where, how can I give them that money? The story has to be convincing uh, and you don't want them to be thinking about details or something that's on the slide that doesn't make sense or something that's not consistent. So make sure that there, there is that logical, consistent narrative running right through the deck so that the investor isn't thinking about anything else other than investing. When you present the upside, make sure that it is believable and don't say things that aren't true in, in any shape or form. Make sure as well that there aren't any typographical errors on it or any grammatical errors, because that just says to the investor, well, I haven't got time to check on the slide deck or I have, I, I'm not prepared to spend the uh, time making sure that this is correct. And if you're not going to do that on the deck, then they'll think, he or she'll think that you're not doing that in the business. Something else that we haven't spoken about because we focused on the content of the deck is, is the soft skills around presenting it. So as well as presenting the deck and the business opportunity, you have to get across your own integrity, your passion, your experience, your knowledge, the skill that you've got in taking this business through, your commitment to doing that and the vision uh, that you have for the business in the future. So all of that has to come across as well. And uh, while it's quite a challenge to do that, um, successful pitches will generate successful investment. So at that point, well, we say thank you. And um, I don't know whether there are any questions, um, but if there are any, we'll be happy to answer them. And I'll stop presenting now.